for this week, we have again Roman Gomez presenting on uh, on top at plasma instrumentation. And just as a brief intro for uh, for Roman, uh, Roman uh, as a PhD is a senior research scientist at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas, uh, where he's the instrument scientist for the Solar Wind Follow On and Solar Wind Plasma Sensor, or SWFO and the instrument lead in training on the Tandem Reconnection and Cusp Electrodynamics Reconnaissance Satellites Analyzer, or tracers, uh, with the Cusp Ion Instrument, uh, or the ACI. Uh, so in these capacities, he develops, calibrates, and assists with data analysis from plasma instrumentation currently on these spacecraft. And Roman was uh, instrumental, so to speak, in the MMS HPCA uh, Hot Plasma Composition Analyzer mission, uh, launched in 2015, of course, to survey uh, Earth's magnetopause for magnetic reconnection, uh, and IES Rosetta uh, ion electron spectrometers to measure plasma characteristics of uh, the comets, and Comet 67P in particular, uh, as it interacts with uh, the solar wind. Roman hails from San Antonio, Texas, and is heavily involved in the community there. Uh, he briefs and inspires youth at Rick's teenagers, college hopefuls in science, career, and educational matters as well. Uh, so with that, Roman, uh, feel free to take it away here and looking forward to the presentation. All right, thank you very much, Jason. And, and really, thank you very much for the, for the invite. Uh, it's always nice to talk about instrumentation. Uh, you know, it, it's so important in what we do. And often uh, we kind of, I think it, it gets kind of put to the side uh, when we talk about the science. So let me get ready to share my screen here. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, now I'm, I'm talking about top hat plasma instruments. Uh, I personally don't own a top hat, but I figured a cowboy hat would be appropriate since we're speaking from Texas. So uh, talking about top hat plasma instruments, and or subtitled here is why you shouldn't underestimate salad bowls. And you'll understand why I say that when uh, we get further into the presentation. So just to kind of outline, uh, first talking about a little bit of what's up in the universe. You know, what are we dealing with when we talk about our composition? Then we'll go on to talking about what an electrostatic analyzer is. That's the plasma sensor that we, we preferred plasma sensor. Uh, general characteristics what kind of uses you have for this actually quite very versatile tool. And then we're going to shift our discussion to top hat electrostatic analyzers. And they come in a number of different uh, flavors, but we're going to talk about spherical and toroidal top hat analyzers and then the advantages of those particular instruments. So, uh, if you, if you haven't been under a rock, we all know that the universe, actually, it's funny. I, I think about it on a regular basis. Uh, it's quite humbling, right? We only understand uh, the makeup of about 4% of our entire universe. 73% is dark energy, 23% is dark matter. Uh, before I did this uh, realm of research, I was actually doing dark matter search, which meant that you had to spend a lot of time under a mountain with a detector because, you know, with penetrating radiation out in space being a problem for us, it's just any kind of radiation when you're trying to detect something like dark matter is problematic as well. And so of this more familiar matter, uh, we've got about 0.3% of that are neutrinos, and 0.3% of that are heavy elements, but uh, quite a bit is in stars. And then of course, the vast majority is in the form of free hydrogen and helium, which is left over from the you know, time just after the Big Bang. Now, as far as that normal matter that we're familiar with, baryonic matter, the overwhelming majority of it exists in the form of plasma, which, you know, it's funny, we understand that in the community. When I talk to my students about this in my astronomy class, you know, they're absolutely bewildered because that's something we're not really familiar with. The temperature range in which we exist does not really uh, afford that, you know. I mean, if you want to see plasma, you either go out into space or you try to make it when you're, you know, have a fusion machine. Um, so plasma, of course, is a quasi-neutral, uh, quasi-neutral entity, quasi-neutral substance, uh, equal numbers of uh, uh, charged particles, electrons, and ions. And of course, depending on the density of the plasma and your vantage point, you know that quasi-neutral quality will change. You know, if you're looking at the solar wind from far away, you may end up seeing it as, um, you know, as a, as a neutral fluid. But, you know, if you have an instrument 
situated inside of the solar wind, it's of course, you're going to see the individual charges. Now that charged nature of these plasmas is, makes them susceptible to electric and magnetic fields. And of course, you know, we, we're, the earth has a magnetic field, Jovian, uh, the Jovian uh, magnetosphere, we have uh, a very strong magnetic field there uh, around Jupiter, Saturn, and those things drive planetary dynamics. So, you know, plasmas are a nice probe into that activity. But the problem is that humans are not geared to look directly at what is going on with the plasma, just like we're not able to see things in X-ray or UV or IR or anything like that. So what you have to do is you have to make something that can translate that language for you. And that is exactly what an electrostatic analyzer is for. So what is an electrostatic analyzer? It's a type of sensor used to make measurements of charged particles based on their energy to charge ratio. And so this should tell you that if you have neutral particles that are interacting with your instrument, you're not going to see their effect. Okay? It, it only works on charged particles. Now, in that function, it serves as a bandpass filter. Uh, it sounds funny, but what it does is it actually selects particles based on a specific range of energies. And if those energies do not lie in that range, it rejects them. It's also an electrostatic prism in that when it accepts these particles, it will actually separate them based on their respective energy. Now, ESA construction is relatively simple. It's similar to that of a capacitor. You know, you have cylindrical capacitors, you can have spherical capacitors. The basic construction is you've got two conducting electrodes that are separated by a distance. Another thing that was fascinating to me uh, when I first started learning about these things is that they are ion optical devices. They have uh, fields of view, angular fields of view that are you know, set by their construction parameter. They have focal points and they can even exhibit aberrations. Uh, if you're familiar with the two primary type of optical telescope, we have reflecting telescopes and we also have refracting telescopes. Research grade telescopes are reflecting telescopes because a mirror doesn't care what your uh, wavelength is. It's going to uniformly set the focal point. They'll, all, all those individual wavelengths will arrive at the same focal point. On the other hand, if you've got a lens, a lens can act as a prism. And so they are given to something known as chromatic aberration where the different wavelengths, you know, blue being a shorter wavelength is uh, deflected to a a, a focal point that is closer to the lens and red with a longer wavelength is deflected to a portion or a point, a focal point farther from the lens. So the, these ESAs can uh, have that same effect. All right, so when we're talking about electrostatic analyzers, uh, again, it can take on a number of different geometries. In space physics, curved plates are preferred. Curved plates, uh, there's, a problem with parallel plate analyzers when it comes to being able to deflect particles. Uh, so, and not only that, uh, your ultraviolet, especially if you're doing a, a survey that's near the earth, one of the contaminants you're gonna find is ultraviolet radiation. If you have a parallel plate analyzer just looking straight out, you're just gonna get hammered. So having a bent plate geometry allows you to have some inherent UV radiation rejection. All of these things measure differentially in flux. In other words, if you set a voltage, it's, uh, it's analogous to an energy, and then you set the range based on your plate spacing. I'll get to that in a little bit, uh, in just a little bit. And then they are charge selective. It's based upon your applied potentials. Now, the way we normally run ESAs in space plasma physics experiments is we apply a voltage to the inner plate so we apply a voltage to the inner plate and the outer plate is usually set at spacecraft down, ground. And then the polarity or the charge of the particle you attract is based on the polarity of the potential you place on your inner plate. So if you place a positive charge, you're going to be looking for negatively charged particles or electrons. And if you place a negative charge, you're going to be looking for positively charged particles. Again, basic construction parameters, you have an outer radius, an inner radius, 
And then you have a bending angle, which is the span of your analyzer plates. So how do they work? As I said earlier, you place a potential difference between the two uh, analyzer plates. That potential difference sets up an electric field. And that electric field uh, is an analogous to an energy range. And the simplest way to, to, to visualize it is that you've got central force motion. Okay, so the simplest um, trajectory that you could visualize would be a particle coming in at the center between the two plates and following a circular path completing the orbit and going and impacting the detector and giving you a count. So there's an energy matching condition that goes along with that. What you're trying to do is match the energy far from the analyzer with some potential difference that you place between those two plates. And that potential difference that you apply between the two plates, as I stated earlier, sets the center energy of your passband based on your deflection capability. So, so here's some quick ESA quantities. So I mentioned the deflection or the analyzer constant. Again, it's a measure of how well an ESA deflects particles. The bigger the analyzer constant, the less of a potential difference you have to apply between the plates in order to get them to deflect at, a, at a, you know, given a, a, a constant energy. And so it's funny, it's a, it is a construction parameter. It's based on the mean radius divided by twice the plate separation, okay? The average radius between the plates divided by twice the plate separation. But I said earlier that when you're in space physics experiments, you usually use spacecraft ground on your outer plate and you set your inner plate to some potential. And in that case, when you use unbalanced plate voltages, it, the, the analyzer constant that you express is equal to the analyzer constant that is set by the construction parameters minus a half. And this happens pretty much unilaterally. Uh, it happened with HPCA. HPCA had a, an analyzer constant of 5.92 if you just did the math and figured out what it's K. But when you did it uh, when you, in calibration, it expressed an analyzer constant of about 5.4 or 5.9 minus one half. The passband center energy is set by, again, your analyzer constant multiplied by the, the potential difference between the plates. So what you see in this plot here is the passband energy or the path energy passband of an analyzer. Again, this is done in analyzer constant space. So the analyzer constant for this ESA is about 10.1. Uh, the that means that if you apply a 100 volt potential across this ESA, your your center passband energy will be 101 electron volt. The other thing that is set by your ESA's plate spacing is the energy resolution. And so it turns out that in addition to your analyzer constant setting the center energy, the analyzer constant or the inverse of it defines what your energy resolution is going to be. So this, it, it comes close. If you do one over 10, you get you know 9%. Here, this delta E over E, our energy resolution is 8%. And this defines instantaneously the energy range that your analyzer can see when you have it parked at a certain energy. So this is your field of view, so to speak, in energy, and it changes with the voltage. Another property is the fact that these ESAs have angular fields of view. So they they see in they see in some solid angle field of view, and that one of those parameters of solid angle is called alpha. And it's measured, it's kind of in the ver vertically with respect to the aperture normal. In this case, we see a, a spherical electrostatic analyzer. So that angle is tied to the energy resolution. 
And we'll see, and it's coupled again through the construction parameter. Another angle is the, or it's called beta, that is kind of horizontally across the aperture. And so one of these, again, this one, your alpha is tied to the central force motion that your particles undergo in the intraplate space. The beta angle is not subject to the electric field of the hemispheres so much. It's actually attributable more to just the analyzer geometry. So in this case, you've got a spherical, 90 degree spherical analyzer and these particles coming in. It's almost like if you had three people starting at the hemisphere or three, uh, three people starting at the equator, if they all walked in straight lines to the North Pole, they'd all eventually meet. That's basically the effect that's going on here in this spherical electrostatic analyzer. <clears throat> so the ESA is a filter. I, I told you earlier that, a, that the ESA filters particle energies and angles because it's using the plate radii to constrain that range. So here you can see some extreme rays. There are two extreme rays of an ESA. One ray intersects at the outer plate is tangent at the uh, at half the bending angle on the inner plate and then exits the ESA again at the outer plate. The other enters close to at the inner plate is tangent at half the bending angle at the outer plate and then exits on the inner plate. These are extreme rays. Now, these are, the, these are the extreme rays that get in, okay? Nothing lower than that in energy or angle and nothing higher than that in, inter, or in, in energy or angle will get in to your ESA. So that's how it filters. Again, but notice that it acts as a prism. It will take particles of different Analyzers, these principal rays are, again, not an artifact, but they are part of the, the construction. They are part of the behavior. They, there are characteristic rays of an electrostatic analyzer. In this case, these are the, these rays, and as you'll see shortly, form the basis for the half maximum, uh, the half maximum response of the electrostatic analyzer. The previous rays, give you the full maximum response of the analyzer. But again, these rays are analogous to when you're trying to find how an image is formed by an object for a convex lens. You have one ray that comes in straight and then is bent. You have another ray that comes in bent and then is straight. And then you have your easy axis. This easy axis would end up being your particle that simply follows the curve along the middle of the radius. So this is the last, I promise, the last uh, optical property uh, of an ESA. He's even teach an entire class on this, and books have been written on this stuff. I, I, again, I find them fascinating. I think it's always important that when you're doing research with something, it shouldn't be afraid to fall in love with it. And I obviously have fallen in love with electrostatic analyzers. So as I showed earlier, or displayed earlier a couple of slides back, a 90 degree spherical electrostatic analyzer will take particles that are entering the aperture parallel, you know, a plane parallel beam, and it will focus them down to a point. Again, it's based on geometry. A 180 degree uh, spherical electrostatic analyzer can either take parallel rays, it'll run them to a focus at half the bending angle and then give you another parallel array of, of uh, rays. So it you either goes parallel to parallel, or if you introduce them at a point at half the, uh, half the bending angle, you'll end up having a, a parallel array of particles, but then they will go to a point at the ESA exit. And as I was showing you earlier, all those rays correspond to these 
individual points in the transmission space. So points one and two are the extreme rays that define the very kind of cutoff points where you're not going to be able to see particles anymore. And then your rays three, four, and five all define your half maximum response, uh, response envelope. And so this right here is just using the calculations. There's a book called uh, Gosling's, it's by Jack Gosling, it's called the ESA Cookbook. And so you can get the formulas in there and you can work out the math and you will actually be able to get this space to outline. But it's really interesting that when you go and you run a simulation or you actually do a calibration, you get the same behavior. You know, there's some point, some maximum, uh, maximum entry angle and lowest energy or minimum entry angle and highest energy that past that point, you really don't get any, you don't get any transmission. And so this plot here shows you one of the characteristics of an electrostatic analyzer. I was telling you that these things see differential in energy, but they say linearly in angle. But this right here is the instantaneous view in energy and angle that your ESA has. And so again, I've, I've done this in energy analyzer space. That, that means that if you have your ESA tuned at, again, uh, one, uh, 10 volts, then this is 100 volts and you see to from maybe the 95, to one, almost 120 uh, electron volts. That's the span in energy. And again, it keeps the same span and angle. If you made it a thousand volts between the two, then you're looking at, I'm sorry, at a hundred volts, then you're looking at a thousand EV or and then from a range from 950 to you know, almost 1200 electron volts. So it's again, it's differential. And what ends up happening is this transmission space stays the same dimensionally, but as you increase the voltages, you look further and further out in energy, it's, it gets larger, it gets larger. All right, so ESAs in the laboratory, very useful. Um, what you're seeing in this top image here is a calibration reference unit for one of our calibration systems at Southwest Research Institute. It's comprised of a Faraday cup, an electrostatic analyzer, and then a beam imager. And so, you know, when you're doing calibration, uh, the whole point is to provide a known uh, source, in this case, a plasma, to the instrument, which is currently an unknown, right? That's why you're illuminating it with a known plasma, a known ion beam, to be able to tease out what its little behavioral idiosyncrasies are. And so, uh, we have our Faraday cup to allow us to measure current. We have our electrostatic analyzer. And this electrostatic analyzer has an energy resolution that's 1%, okay, or 0.01 EV per EV. Um, it's funny, we were trying to see how, uh, how monoenergetic our beam was. And when we did the measurement, we actually came out with the theoretical response of the analyzer. So that means that our, our energy resolution was actually, you know, uh, our, our beam energy sp spread is actually less than the resolution of the analyzer, which is, you know, a very nice thing to have. You can also use it in reverse. You can use it to provide high precision uh, ion beams, high precision in energy. So what you do is you do the reverse. You introduce a plasma source at the back of the ESA. You set the ESA for a particular energy and then you provide a monoenergetic beam. So again, this is something that is useful in the laboratory. Uh, you know, it, again, just like we said, you know, to have a, a well calibrated, well characterized beam. That also helps when you're attempting to do some type of magnetic sector or time of flight mass measurement. Uh, you want to introduce all of your species at the same energy because their velocities will be different, right? So that's what you do in a time of flight is you're trying to uh, separate them based on their velocities. The same thing goes with the magnetic sector. 
So that's what you end up using these for in a laboratory. Now for ESAs in space physics, the primary job of an ESA in space physics is to measure the velocity distribution function of a plasma. And so, you know, again, velocity distribution function is a statistical representation of what all the particles are in a plasma population are doing. And you look at it in different levels. You know, if you want to see what the bulk properties are, you get the velocity distribution function, you take averages over it, known as moments, and then you can find out what the bulk velocity is, or what the number density is, or what the pressure is, or temperature. Okay. You can also look at it in more of mesoscale or microscale phenomena, things like magnetic reconnection. And so you're looking at for acceleration processes, you know, jets and things like that, which are indicators of um, ongoing magnetic reconnection. What the ESA does is, as I was showing you earlier, it looks in angle linearly, looks differentially in, uh, in energy. And so if you have this velocity distribution function out in space, you are trying to bin it. You know, it, it, it's funny, you can say it slices, it dices, it chops, it hops. That's kind of what it's doing here. You're slicing up the velocity distribution function. If you had a perfect analyzer that could go and sample this velocity distribution function, you would be able to get it in its entirety. The only problem is, is in order to do that, you'd have to scan for such a long time, the plasma would probably change and you would lose your resolution. Okay, and I'm also sure that they won't fund you for 10,000 years to do uh, you know, some type of survey like that. So what you have to do is you have to make a trade-off. You know, what kind of resolution do I need in order to get the measurement I require? And so this is when you start playing with construction your, your construction parameters. So what an ESA does, of course, in conjunction with a detector is you measure counts per unit solid angle. After you've got those counts, you have to convert that to a particle flux, right? It, it counts are just counts. You need physical quantities. So in order to convert counts to particle flux, you use that something called the geometric factor. The geometric factor is a convolution of the energy angle the azimuthal resolution, and then the effective area, which is based on the, the physical area of the aperture, and then whatever efficiencies, detector efficiencies otherwise, that are included in that response. After you have determined your flux, you can then go and create an array from those counts that represents your velocity distribution function. And this, is, this would be how you would go about you know, doing that conversion. So the geometric factor is, again, it's the inherent ability of the analyzer to resolve the plasma. It's your conversion factor. That's how you go from just plain old counts to physical quantities. Now, traditional electrostatic analyzers They've accepted particles through planar apertures. And this gives you two issues. One, there's a cosine dependence on the particle flux through the aperture. So the way this is shown here, um, particles arriving here, these are shown to be the same, but if you honestly do a measurement, you will find that particles entering with this uh, angle of incidence relative to the aperture, you're gonna have a reduced flux. The other problem is that your maximum field of view across that aperture is usually no larger than 160 degrees. But we need to measure as much of the plasma as we possibly can in order to get this velocity distribution function. So in this case, and you know, again, these kinds of analyzers can work very well, but again, if your idea is to see as much of the plasma as you possibly can, then you need to kind of think about other ways of getting at getting past this problem. So focusing on particle flux, 
we can find ways to optimize our measurements. Okay, so the particle flux of an instrument, again, is the number of particles you get measure divided by the geometric factor, divided by the energy center of the passband, divided by the acquisition time that you have. So if you are measuring plasma phenomenon, you have to think in this trade space. If your instrument is too small, aperture is too small, you're gonna have a small geometric factor. And so you're gonna to have to sit for a long time. But if you're trying to measure microscale phenomena that are occurring on the order of seconds or even milliseconds, you've gotta find a way to increase that geometric factor in a way that you can still resolve the instrument, still resolve the flux. Larger instrument, large G, you're gonna, so the larger the geometric factor, the more poor the resolution that you have of the phase space, which again, which may not be problematic. If you're looking at particularly hot plasmas that have a very large distribution in KT, then using a, a large geometric factor may not hurt you so much. And again, this is all combined with the flux problem that we saw on the previous slide. So here's your needs. Uh, I need to increase my angular field of view, but I don't want to increase instrument size. I would like to maintain the resolution of a smaller instrument, you know, if there's a way that I can subdivide it. And then we also saw that we had this uneven flux across the aperture. So it would be really nice if we could find a way that you could kind of even that out. So Back in 1982 and in 1988, uh, two authors, Carlson et al. and Young et al. 1988, proposed taking either a 90 degree spherical analyzer, or in this case, you'll see a 90 degree toroidal analyzer. And what you do is you rotate them about a symmetric, their symmetry axis. Just make them a, you know, a, a, a volume of revolution, so to speak. And what you do is you provide a means by which the particles can enter via your aperture, but then you kind of preserve your original geometry. So here you've got a spherical plate geometry. In this one, you have a toroidal geometry. So again, your, your, your plate revolutions are offset by some small distance. So again, you are able to keep the, the UV rejection capability of a curved plate analyzer. You keep the higher analyzer constant, but because they are rotationally symmetric, you are providing the same kind of aperture to particles regardless of their angle of entry into the aperture. And again, what makes a, a, an analyzer, a top hat analyzer, a top hat ESA, is that the particle trajectories cross the symmetry axis. So in other words, particles coming in from this side of the electrostatic analyzer, sorry about that, uh, and this side of the analyzer come and impact here. Same thing on the other end here. Now, <clears throat> the spherical top hat ESA has analyze or has characteristics and it preserves, it preserves those transmission characteristics that we see with these curve plate or the spherical analyzer. You got a beta FOV of two pi. And again, regardless of their angle of entry, they, these particles are seeing the same uh, and the same aperture. It takes four construction parameters in this case. So you have your two plate radii, your outer and your inner plate you have a top hat opening angle. And generally with a spherical, the distance between the central portion under the top hat opening angle or under the top hat and this held at ground, it's twice the plate spacing. So basically you have half the field strength here, which goes to, again, your field, the, the normal field strength, and then you have your deflection. And they, these have been quite extensively used. Um, the most recent usage 
has been FPI, DIS, DES. Of course, uh, DIS and DES uh, only see, uh, they're set on the HPCA spacecraft so that they only, they're, they're, they basically have a field of view about 180 degrees. But um, <clears throat> there's two instruments on each spacecraft. So, you know, they've got a, they've got a full uh, field of view at every spin. All right, you also have the toroidal. And so the toroidal analyzer actually has six construction parameters because you have to take into consideration your offset. You still have your uh, inner and outer plate radii. And you have this delta Z. This is your top hat opening. This would be your top hat opening. In this case, you have a flat, seems like a parallel plate capacitor in here. That parallel plate capacitor gives way to your interplate space. And then you, you know, follows the same suit as it would in a spherical analyzer where you have the, the particle trajectories deflected based on their energy. There is one more uh, variant of toroidal top hat. And uh, this is, is it's, it's actually quite clever. Um, you match your radii. So you provide a spherical center with combined with a toroidal outer portion or a toroidal inner plate space. And this actually serves to improve your beta field of view, your, your particles coming in uh, are basically normal to the aperture in this case. They, you have improved focusing. This was used on the cluster mission and it wasn't used in the version that you see here. It actually had a slightly larger bending angle. Okay, so toroidal ESAs are useful in that. Unlike a spherical analyzer, which has uh, your, your foci are coincident. As we know with, with toroids, you have two foci and they are non-coincident. They're astigmatic by nature. And you can conform these things so that the focal point actually protrudes outside of the plate. You, know, you can use it. You can use these toroidal ESAs as a standalone. That was what was done with IES Rosetta. The reference is Birch's all 2006. It's also being used. In the, that's what we're using on the solar wind plasma sensor or SWIPS. They are also useful with time of flight or mass resolving sections. So, one example is Polar Timus, which I'll have a figure of that shortly. You can take a look at that. And then we recently used it with the carbon foil time of flight of MMS HVCA and cluster CODIF. Pepe DS1 is another version of a, of a uh, toroidal analyzer that was used in conjunction with a time of flight mass section. So on the left is a figure of Cassini IMS. You are the ion, Cassini ion mass spectrometer. You can see that you have a toroidal electrostatic analyzer. This is what allows you to um, analyze particle arrival in terms of their energy and angle. And Cassini IMS was actually set on a mechanical actuator. So this is how it would change its field of view. This thing could go plus minus 160 degrees, it would change the look direction. But in addition to your energy angle analysis, you uh, complete your orbit through the interplate space. Then you strike a post acceleration region, about 14, almost 15 kilovolts. You penetrate a carbon foil. And then you can do one of two things. Uh, so there's a linear electric field in this region. This is another curiosity of uh, ion optics. There are analogs all over the place. So again, we talked that this is an analog to a lens. The reflectron that you see in here, okay, this linear electric field sets up a situation where you can have an electrostatic mirror. And so these particles, some of the particles that don't have enough energy to reach the bottom portion held at positive 14.6 kilovolts, actually get reflected up and you can still get a mass 
measurement. And the interesting thing about this design is that you were doing position resolution with your electrons, the electrons coming down, and then your mass resolution was done with the uh, reflectron or with a straight through time of flight. Polar Timus is another version of, it, it is a top hat in that it does accept across the symmetry axis. Um, you actually have two staged electrostatic analyzers. One is energy selecting and one, oh, sorry, one is angle focusing, the other one is energy focusing. And then you take those energy focused ions and introduce them into a magnetic sector. And so, you know, your magnetic sector allows you to, to divide or to separate and detect your individual species based on their deflection within the, the magnetic field. Okay, a lot of analyzers are required to work on uh, spacecraft that, that have fixed fields of view. And so you have to share this workspace with things like UV spectrometers, neutral spectrometers, optical spectrometers, IR. So they have to, again, maintain the same field of view, the same look direction. But with a plasma, you've got to see more space in order to get a good feel or get a good measurement of what is going on. So no spinning, no problem. You know, again, FPI, HPCA, those are on spinning platforms. That's a very good way for them to be employed. But if you can't spin, you can still get a good field of view with these instruments. And you use toroidal analyzers in order to do it. So this is IES Rosetta. You, in addition to having your, uh, your energy analyzing electrostatic analyzer inside, and this one actually simultaneously viewed both ions and electrons, you have another toroidal analyzer that is stationed outside, okay, it's external. And with this toroidal grid and with the voltages applied, you're actually able to deflect. So in addition to sweeping or changing the voltage on your inner ESA, you also change the voltage on the outer deflector. And so you hold your energy constant, change your deflection, change your voltage on the inner ESA to change your energy view, but then you just go through the same uh, series of deflections. And again, this allows you to increase your field of view up to a 90 degree field of view, which is significant when you are trying to see the directional flows of plasma. One more top hat the ESA, there's a, something called the cusp. This is a, what's known as a frustrated toroid. So weak toroids have a slight deviation from the center line. This cusp ESA actually has uh, your, your rotation centers brought across the symmetry axis. Like, there we go, my red dot. So if you notice your, your rotation, your center of rotation actually sits on this side of your symmetry axis. What is interesting about this is that this very faithfully reproduces the angular resolution, the beta resolution, the very sharp beta resolution that you get with a, a spherical section electrostatic analyzer. Now, of course, it has a few more construction parameters, which again, either makes your optimization space kind of tough, but you know, it's always about trying to find that balance between what you need and what you want. Okay, that's, that's ultimately what it is. So, top hat electrostatic analyzers maintain the optics of their flat aperture counterparts, but they avoid or they afford larger fields of view. And toroidal ESAs usually have bending angles that are greater than 90 degrees. So along with that and their astigmatic properties, they do allow you to couple better to mass measurement sections. Uh, again, remember that for any experiment, the mission and the ESA capabilities need to fit the measurement, okay? And so always refer back to that trade space and energy time and resolution. Uh, if these are the books that got me started. Uh, I highly recommend them. If you can get a hold of the ESA cookbook and you're interested in this stuff, this is a great place to start. Applied Charge Particle Optics by Libel, 2006 is great. And then the Optics of Charged Particles by Volnick uh, from 1987, 
This is the first time I actually saw that like your standard optical components, there is a, a transfer matrix, matrix treatment for these electrostatic analyzers. So uh, that is pretty much my spiel. spiel. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about something that I absolutely adore. And I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. Excellent. Thank you very much, Roman. Really, really appreciated that talk, especially I uh, mentioned you know, earlier before we got going that I use a lot of this data, but it's just uh, sometimes it's that black box and you know, we take it for granted a lot and not know how the, the inner workings uh, are happening. So uh, that's that's fascinating for me. And there's definitely a couple of questions as well. Before I jump to those, I do want to make a quick note for next week as we continue our uh, instrument theme talks. We're going to have Ashley Greeley from Goddard, who's going to be sharing an experimentalist's approach to solid state detectors. Uh, so that'll contrast our ESA presentation here. And with that, we do have some time for some questions here. So uh, the first one I saw, there were a couple from uh, Jason Durer. And the first one is, uh, is there a theoretical way to determine uh, that the K sub UV differs from K by 0 0.5? I think that was on some of the earlier slides. And he said, or is this just what is seen from the calibration techniques? No, actually, um, if you get going, I, and I discovered this going with Gosling's uh, original formulation. So going from the, the cookbook with individual voltages on the uh, on the inner and outer plates if you set the outer plate to zero it just kind of pops out um it, and it's really fascinating that it does i was kind of floored when uh when, when i saw that occur and it's funny because i i actually went and derived it multiple times um while i was in while i was in the office and uh i think the funny story is my my ex-wife called me to see when I was going to come home at two o'clock. And then she called me at 7 p.m. Uh, to ensure I was going home. And I was I was so engrossed with actually doing the derivation. So uh, maybe that's why she's ex-wife. Anyway, um, but yeah, no, it does pop out mathematically. Cool. OK, yeah, very interesting. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Jason's second question may have already been uh, answered in, in the chat there. So I'm going to move on then to Lynn's question. Uh, so Lynn asks, what is the biggest obstacle to increasing the energy resolution, like in these detectors? So that is, say he wanted a 5% or even a 3% increase in the energy resolution, what would be the first obstacle or issue from an instrument builder's perspective that you'd point out? So that's a really good question. Um, so one of the things that is limiting is your plate spacing, right? And, and your energy range. So let's assume that you really wanted to make you wanted to be able to make an analyzer that could see a very large range in energy, you would have to increase your plate spacing. But when you increase your plate spacing, you increase your volume, right? You naturally increase your volume, you're going to increase your mass and all these things. Um, on the other hand, uh, you can defeat that by making your analyzer very small. But then when you decrease the interplate space, you're starting to cut back on the types of, or the, the, the magnitudes of potentials that you can apply between them. So there's a trade-off, you know, um, right now we are looking at getting an analyzer that has about a one millimeter spacing to be able to scan 32 KeV, which would, which would be necessary to resolve a solar wind speed of 2,500 kilometers per second. Um, yeah, again, the stipulated uh, safety value is one kilovolt per, per millimeter, but again, in order to achieve that, you got to analyze your constant of like 10, so you'd have to apply 3,200 volts. So that definitely goes 3.2 kilovolts per millimeter. I think that's the limiting factor, you know, of what, how you want to do it and whether or not you can afford those capabilities within that trade space of volume and energy and, and you know, um, volume, power, and time. That's really what it is. Hopefully I answered that. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely helpful to, yeah, to think through. And actually speaking of references, I think uh, Mark had posted a link to the uh, Gosling research there in the chat for anyone who's, yes. who's following that. 
And so, yeah, after that, we have another question then from Conrad. And Conrad asks, is there a theory for determining the correlation between the ESA voltage and the deflector voltage? Uh, for context, uh, there's a complex relationship between the FPI ESA voltage and deflector voltage, but it isn't clear that there is a theory that kind of attaches with this. So any no, and you know, I knew Conrad would ask something like, no, um, <laughs> no, it's, the, I think the, the best way to try to approach it from a first principles feel of view and it's something that I've been trying to do because you know you do see this kind of crazy interesting interaction between the electrostatic analyzers voltage and between the the uh, deflector voltage I think one way that you could do that to kind of attack it is to use the matrix or the transfer matrix uh, approach to these optical components, at least in, if you're just looking at it within the plane. Um, you know, it's it's that same thing where, you know, if you have a series of lenses and mirrors, you can take each of the transfer matrices and combine them, you know, multiply them together and you come out with the transfer matrix for your system. I think that's that would be an, a valid approach with this and it's something that I'm trying to do, but um, it, it's, again, it's difficult, it's not a, <laughs> It's no mean feat, that's for sure. Certainly, yeah, that makes sense. It kind of segues into a question I have as well. I'm gonna ask that one after Ankush though. Uh, okay. So there was, um, yeah, Ankush's question then was I think about the longevity of the instrumentation. So he had asked how stable is the ESA for long operational use? And can you comment on the degradations that want, you know they might suffer over time? You know, again, I have a, the only, I guess, long-term examples we have are Cassini IMS is a really good example, right? Cassini was they wrote they arrived in two thousand and was it two thousand or that they arrived? I'm probably wrong on that. Um, no, they launched in ninety seven. They arrived in Saturn in 04. And they had a number of extended missions, and the ESA lasted almost until they did the you know the swan song dive into the Saturnian atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, Again, another example is HPCA. HPCA is still going very strong. Uh, it's been in orbit now. We're coming up on I think, what March twelfth makes it. Is it March twelfth makes it six years or something like that? We launched in twenty fifteen. Yeah, and, I think so. And so you know, long term, at least five six years. You know, we're it's it's still going very strong. Um, the only. I mean, the only things that you're really going to suffer with, again, they're they're essentially a capacitor, right? So if you have, if the only way you could compromise the inner workings of an electrostatic analyzer is if something got in there, or in the case of you know you've got ESAs that are blackened, some of that blackening falls off and makes it continuous, and then it's not going to work anymore. But I haven't seen anything like that occur, and uh, again. Both of those instruments I mentioned have seen quite a quite a bit of action. Mm, certainly, yeah, it's helpful, and I think Lynn kind of confirms that too in the comment he mentioned on wind uh, that the uh, the instrumentations there still have been working nominally for over twenty. Yeah, 20, no, 20 yeah, years. That's a real, that's a really good example. Wind, wind, yeah, absolutely. Certainly, yeah. And actually that kind of, so my, my question then comes in a little bit as I was, I think it was some of your earlier slides, maybe around 14 or 18, where you were kind of talking about even just the simulation of how the kind of simulating these apertures and the particle responses actually let you know matches fairly well with the theoretical curves and you know in that simulation plot you kind of even have a effective distribution of, of where the particles are kind of landing maybe within the detector yeah. and I was just kind of wondering if you know with these with the simulation of those of these instrument responses can you effectively input, you know, say like a particular source distribution, like a, you know, a double Maxwellian or like a crescent type thing and see, oh, you know, here we're going to have a preferential measurement yeah. of this. And yeah, that's, I mean, and actually, and you bring up a really good point, Jason, you know, it, it you know, the nice thing about simulations is that they're so doggone cheap. You know, you can, mm -hmm. you can uh, put together a model of your instrument and then feed in some input. And so that's one thing that you know, I've discussed with friends, you know, you know, I'm, I'm doing all these, when you, when you do your simulations, you're trying to fill the aperture, right? You're trying to find the total transmission space for these things. But if you could get a semi on program and 
make a make a look or, or make an ion or make a particle distribution that your ESA could sample from. Yeah, absolutely. You could predict exactly what the uh, response or you know what your measurements would look like. You absolutely could. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. That's great. So cool. And I think there's also in the in the chat there some instrument or some uh, interest in the links to these various books. I know there was one to Gosling posted earlier, and I think a couple of folks uh, were we're asking about the ESA cookbook. Uh, what's the official title for that? If they were to Google it, it's, um, um, it's uh, it is. If, if you look it up, the ESA cookbook by Gosling. It's a it's a Los Alamos. If you look in the um, if you look up, I gave it's a Los Alamos report number is what it is. Okay. So if you look for that Los Alamos report number, you should be able to find it. Um, Bolnick's um, Bolnick's. I had to find Bolnick's title online just a little actually it was today i was trying to remember how to it's a hard book to find it's a hard book to find because it's older you know 87 and everybody thinks that it's a, a it is a classic text but uh no one no one um no one really wants it unless you're kind of in the field but sure. if you go on, online and you look on amazon it's like people are charging like 200 dollars for a copy or something like that so it's uh, yeah okay so still, still in demand, at least for that. Yeah. So, and yeah, and folks can maybe even, you know, contact you or they could contact our email list in case they'd Absolutely. like. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be more, a lot of this stuff came from my, from my, from, I'm sorry, my master's, my PhD thesis. So I'd be more than willing to, you know, send a copy, you know, a copy of my thesis to anyone who was interested. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Excellent. Well, thanks very, very much again, Roman. I think that concludes our, uh, our questions here. Uh, and so with that, yeah, I just really appreciate this talk and I hope folks can tune in next week again as we continue our uh, instrument themed presentations. Uh, with that, I hope everyone has a good rest of their week and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Otto. Thank you, everyone.